Good to look out and see some visiting with us. want you to feel encouraged as you visit with us. I encourage you to take your Bible and study along. In a few moments, we'll stand and have the song of invitation. If you've never put Christ on in baptism, all things have been made ready where you can be baptized for the remission of sins this morning. If you have your Bible this morning, if you'll turn with me to the book of Acts in the third chapter, we will begin reading with you at verse 1. Acts chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. It's interesting when you take your Bible and think about there are a lot of places in New Testament days where people were met. And when you think about this man being at the beautiful gate and begging alms, you'll find that it was an occasion for him to come in contact with people who knew about the Lord. You know, the church of my Lord has seemed insignificant to a lot of people at every age and generation. But it's through the church the Lord gives priceless gifts. You think about it, it's through his people he's given the message that we take and talk about redemption. And here through his apostles, you'll see a great event happen at the temple in Jerusalem. Now, before just a moment, let's get a little background and think about the temple in Jerusalem. You remember that Herod the Great was reigning at that time, or previous to that time, and he was a great builder. And you remember there were Herods that followed him. But Herod was one who built many cities, and he was one who built the temple. And he wanted the people in Palestine and other places to know and to see how important he thought he was. And so his greatest accomplishment was the magnificent temple complex that was built in the city of Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. The Jewish leaders resented the fact that he was friendly with the Romans. Here was Herod who was supposed to be their leader, and yet he showed friendliness to those who they thought were nothing more than occupiers and people who gave them a hard time about their faith and about their uh, place of life. But I want you to think about that he thought this program of building the temple would keep him on good terms with the Jews. So Herod started work on the temple in about 20 B.C., and in John 2.20, you remember the Jews said to Jesus, the temple had been built in 46 years. But in reality, it's going to be another 30 years before it's finally finished. And just about the time it's finally finished in 70 AD, it's going to be destroyed. So here you have these many years of the temple being built, and it doesn't stand long in Jerusalem before the Romans tear it down. And you know, nobody today can be sure exactly what it looked like, but the sources on that time just talk about how splendorous it was. You go back and you'll read about how it was made of white marble, that the east was facing the, the coming up of the sun and it was covered with gold plates and it just reflected the glory of the morning and they had this beautiful thing that they could look at and in their mind that represented their relationship with God. And so here you find that though it's a magnificent structure, it's going to be destroyed. In August of 70 AD, you remember Titus with the Roman army comes and marches on Jerusalem, kills a lot of the Jews, and destroys the temple and takes some of the temple uh, furnishings back to Rome. So I want you to think about this statement. Here's Peter and John going into this magnificent building, something beautiful. And they come to this gate, which is called the beautiful gate. And we talked a little bit about this Wednesday night. That here's this gate, and it's ornate, made of Corinthian bronze, 65 or 60 feet wide and 75 feet tall. 
And here is a man sitting at that gate, and notice he's lame from birth. And notice that he is begging. I thought about that man who sat there. At 3 o'clock, the hour of prayer, he knew where to go, didn't he? He said, here are religious people. Here are people who are going to go to God and give thanks for what they have, and perhaps in their heart they'll see my need. And so here was this gate made of that bronze that took 20 men to open and close, magnificent in sight, no expense spared in, in building it, had the vine on there to show that Israel was the vineyard of God, and here was a man in an ugly circumstance. I'll look at the picture of the gate and then look at the man. What a contrast. Here's the beauty of silver, gold, and Corinthian bronze all mixed together. Here was something that when the light hit it, it would also shine. And then right below it is a man who can't even walk. And so when I thought about that, I began to think about, here is Peter and John coming to the gate. And I've often wondered, did that man look at them and think, I can get something from them? Ever watch the beggar? They know who to ask and don't to ask. I remember one time I was walking with my father downtown Nashville. He was going to the Ryman. And the beggar came. I noticed he didn't ask Daddy for a dime. He came straight to me. You know why? Daddy wouldn't give a dime. He knew where to go. And you think about it, individuals can start to picture who's going to give and who won't. And so here he looks at Peter and John, and he's begging alms. And I thought about Peter and John perhaps thinking of Jesus right there by the beautiful gate. When Jesus had made the statement in John 15, he, you know, it says in uh, John 14, 31, he said, Arise, let us go from here. He's leading them in John 18, 1 to the Kidron Valley. So if they're walking through the city of Jerusalem to get to the Kidron Valley, you have to pass this gate. And that's when Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Jesus may have been looking at the very thing they're looking at, that gate that was, had the picture of the vine. And Jesus is saying, I'm the life source. And without me, you're nothing. Jesus has identified himself to his apostles and to us that he's the bread of life, the water of life, the, the light of the world. All that's just found in John's gospel. And he talks about all these things are necessary for life. You don't have bread, you die. You don't have water, you die. You don't have light, you die. And what he's saying is, spiritually, if you don't have me, you're dead. You're separated from God. He said, I'm the one that can provide you with eternal life. And so here they're looking at a crippled man. And they're thinking about, we can produce fruit. God has given us something that we can give the man. And perhaps gesturing to the gate, saying, I don't have silver and gold. You see the beauty of this gate. I don't have that to offer you. But he says, what I do have to offer you, I have through Jesus Christ. You ever thought of the priceless gift they're going to give that man? That here was a man who had been begging for a livelihood. Every day carried the, to, the, to work. Every day looking for someone to show kindness and, and generosity. And here the, you have an ugly circumstance next to a beautiful gate. But I also thought it was interesting what the apostles say to him. Look at us. At first, he's looking at them, and perhaps they didn't answer soon enough. Perhaps he's afraid he'll miss another opportunity. But they say, no, no, if you're going to talk to us, look at us. I notice Peter and John cared about the man. And they said, we want your attention. And so he gave them his attention, and he expected to receive something. And I thought about that when he said, silver and gold have I not. Perhaps the man's heart dropped at that moment. He said, well, then why are you taking my time? I need food. I need money. I need to be able to make a life. Then Jesus, or Peter says, in the name of Jesus. I love that statement. He says, I can give you something through Jesus. Now, without Jesus, could he have given it? No. The only reason he had the power was Jesus had sent it. He'd sent the Spirit. So now then, when you take your Bible, think about the statement in the book of Acts in the third chapter. Look down, it says in verse 8, when he was able to stand up. It talks about his, his bones being strengthened in, in verse 7. His feet and ankle bones receive strength and leaping up. I like verse 7 because notice what Peter does. He does exactly what Jesus did. He helped him up. He gave him his right hand. Luke, the physician, doesn't leave out any detail. He said he looked down, saw his need, helped him, gave his hand, and the man stood up. 
And that word leaping there is an interesting word. It's from an ancient medical term talking about the socketing of the heel and ankle. And so what Luke is describing would even today take months uh, uh, after a, a corrective surgery of healing and relearning to walk and being able to put weight on it. And notice this was done in a split second. And think about the statement leaping. Where is that a fulfillment of? You go back to Isaiah 35 and verse 6. It said the lame will leap as a deer. You ever thought that man for the first time in his life, he never learned to walk. Because he'd been this way since birth. You imagine just being able to take off walk. You ever watched a baby learn to walk? Man, it's entertaining. It's not yours. You're yours. You're kind of worried, but someone else is just watching. You can almost say six or seven steps, and boom, 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 they're going to fall. Here's a man who's never learned. And he doesn't just walk, he's leaping. I thought about something else. I think it shows his Hebrew background. Notice that when he's able to get up, what he does is he enters the temple and he is praising God. He wasn't concerned about what other people thought. When he came into the temple of the Lord, he'd never been in it before. If you take your Bible and go back to the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus in the 21st chapter, he would have, because of his handicap, never been allowed into the temple in verse 18. If you had a defect like that, you couldn't go into the temple. The gate was as close as he was. He was at the temple, but he wasn't in. And then I thought about when he was able to go in. You ever thought about what that must have been? No, it's the people noticed him. That wasn't ordinary behavior. But the man was so grateful. Then I thought about something else. I thought about the gift that Peter and John gave that man. It was priceless. And I know very little about grammar. I do know it's not grammatically correct to say that there's a gift even more priceless than the one that was priceless. But this is it. To be able to walk. I want to take that. I want to make application the lesson yours. I want you to think about this world like that gate can be a beautiful place. There's a lot of ugliness in the world, but there's some beauty there. And this world, when you look at God's creation from his standpoint, it's much more beautiful than Herod's temple in Jerusalem. And when you look at our lives, especially the lives here where we are, think about our jobs, you think about our families, we have been blessed beyond measure. We cry over things that the third world countries know nothing about. And here we have been blessed. I think about I have a wonderful job. I have a wonderful family. I make money. I love to travel. I've seen some of the country. Hope to see more of it. But as beautiful as you think the world is, it's going to be destroyed just like Herod's temple. In 2 Peter chapter 3, when Peter was writing, he told him, you need to remember that this earth is going to be destroyed. He said in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. As beautiful as the world might be to your eye, Peter says it's going to be burned. Just like Jerusalem was destroyed and just like the temple was destroyed, things that people stood in awe of, this world is going to be destroyed. You know, I think of some time, if I get that in my mind, I would have a problem seeing the spiritual side of life a little better. But the second thing that came to my mind is you think about the lame in this world. Sinners who are looking for healing from past transgressions. Take your Bible and go to Isaiah 53. And when you go to Isaiah 53, you remember that it talked about in verses 4 and 5 what he'd done for us. He carried our sorrows. He was stricken, smitten by God. He was afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. But why was he wounded? This is by his stripes that we're healed. You think about how terrible it would be not to be able to walk. Spiritually, think about what it is to be crippled or to be handicapped. Or to be lost. You know, it's interesting. That's not really ever the word used too much about us being lame. When you're not right with the Lord, he talks about death. You ever thought about Ephesians 2.1? He says, you were dead in your sin and trespasses. You're separated from the one who gives life. You don't have hope of eternal life. And you remember James 2.26 talks about that as the body is without the spirit, so is faith without works. 
When Jesus says in Matthew 23 about the Pharisees, he said, you're like, you look good on the white side, you're white wall sepulchers, but inside you're full of what? Dead men bones. Deadness. So what do people need? They need life. And where do they get it? In Christ. You think about in Christ, we're chosen in him, Ephesians chapter 1. In Christ, we're born again. In Christ, we're buried. In Christ, we're raised. So when I look at the people of God, what I see is people who've been resurrected. When you think about people who've been dead to sin and they've been buried with Christ in baptism and raised up to walk in newness of life, think about the fact what we have is a resurrection. And the mission of the church is to take Jesus to a lame and dying world. And like Peter, we need to say, look at us. We have to reach out to sinners to let them know they can be healed. But let them see the gift that we see. What was the gift that man received? He could walk. What's the gift we receive? Salvation. And notice it's not from silver or gold. In 1 Peter chapter 1, notice Peter, who again is bringing up gold and, and silver, he lets them know that we're saved by the blood of Christ. Notice he says in verse 18, knowing you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. No amount of money can redeem your soul, only the blood of Christ. But that brought up something else in my mind. I thought about the purpose of the church when we go out is to tell them what we can offer. We, like Peter, can't offer money. We don't have a lot of those things to offer. We can't promise money. We can't physically heal anymore. We can't promise social activities that entertain them. All we can offer is the most important thing, Jesus. And through him, eternal life. And we need to let the world know the offer comes through Christ. The saved, the redeemed, is the church. I've had people say, Mike, do you have to be a member of the church to be saved? You don't understand the church? The church is the saved. You're not joining some institution hoping that will save you. You have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. You've been baptized into Christ. You've been raised with Christ. You're a child of God. So often we have this concept that what we need to do is join the church. No, no, no. When you become a child of God, he adds you to the church. Now, you can identify with a local church. That's one thing. But the universal church, the saved, the redeemed, they belong to Jesus. Acts 20, 28, he talked about they've been purchased by the blood of Christ. And so the church is the saved. How can you be saved and not be a part of the redeemed? So only the saved are going to point to others what they need to do to be saved. If God can get it through you, God will give it to you. And sometimes I think the message needs to be preached. He's told us, I've given you good news. You've received the pardon. You've received grace. Now show it to others. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. God gives the healing, but man and the brethren need to reach up to the beggar. And man needs to reach up like the beggar and take God's word. And remember, he's the vine and we're the branches. One last thing. You ever thought there's a difference being at and being in? There was a man who sat at the gate. There are people who come and sit at services. There are people who identify on a Sunday being somewhere, but they're not really in Christ. Or one time they obeyed Christ, but they're not living in Christ. They're not continuing in Christ. They're not walking with Christ. And I think one of the saddest things is to see people so close and yet so far away. To be at the gate, but not in Christ. To be at services, to see Christians, to love members of the Lord's body, but not be one yourself. I thought about that statement when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, you're the temple. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, one may disagree with how the Holy Spirit dwells in us, but I want to tell you what's not up for debate. He does dwell within us. And I'll tell you something. If he doesn't, it's like the body without the spirit. You're dead. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're spiritually dead. 
He's the witness, Romans 8, with your spirit that you're a child of God. Question, are you in Christ? Because one day, my friend, as beautiful as the gate was going into Jerusalem, can you imagine the gate of heaven and going in to see the Father's face? If you need to obey the gospel, we pray you come as together we stand and sing.